Welcome to Encouraging Wellness, where we shed light on the plethora of holistic healing and wellness methods so you can give yourself the power to ask why and become bigger than the condition you are dealing with or the illness you are currently fighting. Join Pamela Wirth as she sits down with doctors, medical experts, healthcare practitioners, and those with unique healing stories to dissect groundbreaking practices that combine traditional Western medicine with alternative modalities. Hear conversations that empower you to go beyond hurtful stigmas, outdated practices, and unnecessary labels, guiding you towards a healthier and happier you. Here, we highlight your true worth and help unleash your inner courage. Now your host, Pamela. Hi, this is Pamela with the Encouraging Wellness Podcast and with Hello Health. And today I've got Dr. Biamonte, and he is not only a naturopath, uh, but certified um, nutritionist and so much more. Welcome, doctor. Hi. So tell us a little bit about your background, um, obviously very uh, varied in a number of different experiences and, and how you got here and, and what you found to be the most impactful. Well, one of the interesting things about me is I'm a member of the Scientific Council of the IAACN which means I'm one of the people that writes the tests that the nutritionists take. So that gives an added dimension to things. Um, originally, I started out when I graduated from school, very interested in the interpretation of lab work, particularly blood work from a nutritional viewpoint. And I found some people who were actually um, doing this already, who were doing it by computer, which is what I wanted to do. This is back in 1984. And you know, back then, computers were... Not a, not the mainstream by any means. They were sort of experimental in, in, in a sense. And I met up with a group of doctors from Grumman Aerospace. Hmm. And they were developing a computer model for NASA. They were under contract for NASA through Grumman to develop a computer which could analyze the blood tests of the astronauts in order to give them the perfect nutritional balance. And I worked with these fellows for quite a few years, and we developed this whole model, which to my knowledge still it's the only existing actual workable model of the human body on computer. We're using this model on patients, and we had a certain percentage of the patients who didn't react correctly. About 30, it was around 30%, 35%. When they took the vitamins, they had strange reactions to the vitamins. So I volunteered to, to find out what was this, you know, what this was, because yeah. this was kind of unheard of. You know, you, you give them these things and they have opposite reactions. And we knew that um, even then we knew that people with low stomach acid had problems tolerating uh, medications and vitamins. But this was something way beyond that. So I was looking through their lab work and I was looking for common denominators and I found that there was a common denominator in the lab work that they all had low neutrophils and high lymphocytes. And the more I took, the more I pinned this down and pulled the string, I determined that they had some type of infection in their intestines. I didn't quite know what it was, but I knew there was something there. So I had them do stool tests with the Great Smokies Labs at the time, which is now Genova Labs. And we found they had Candida. So the candy didn't, was enough to make them not be able to process their vitamins and minerals correctly. Right. Or, and on top of that, give them bad reactions. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what candida was really at the time. So I told them to go to their doctors and tell them, the doctor, you have a candida infection and it's interfering with this vitamin program you're doing and get let the doctor cure you and then come back. Boy, was I stupid. So the doc people came back and they said, well, my doctor says he doesn't know what that is, what candida is. And then other doctors said, well, everybody has candida. And then another doctor said, no, there's no such thing. So right. it was really weird. So I looked up um, in my neighborhood, which was New York City at the time. So I was practicing in New York City. I looked up in the neighborhood, functional doctors who would who would advertise they would treat this. Mm -hmm. So I ended up sending, sending quite a few of them to Dr. Atkins. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hoffman, Ronald Hoffman, who later became a good friend of mine. And the patients came back and said, wow, what a difference that was. These people knew what I was talking about. So they put me on a treatment. I felt better for a while, but then it came back. Hmm. And they, they didn't really know what to do when it came back. So I said to myself, well, I better figure this out. 
And I spent the next couple of years researching Candida, listening to the patients and what they were telling me happened when they would try to treat either with their doctor or by themselves. And eventually it led me to write the book, The Candida Chronicles. And why I call it The Chronicles is because it chronicled my actual adventure in understanding Candida and all the twists and the zigs and the zags that I went through in, in finding out exactly what was going on because it was um, very tricky, I found. Well, for the simplest of terms, what, what is Candida? That's a good that's a good place to start. Candida is an organism. It's a fungus mm -hmm. or a yeast. It's actually dimorphic, which means it lives in two different states. It can live as a yeast or live as a fungus. And it does this in your mucous membranes mostly. So it's it's normal to find it in the intestinal tract of most mammals of all kinds. Birds have have are loaded with candida. Humans have candida, but it's not a dominant organism in your flora. Everyone's heard the term flora nowadays. We know about probiotics from watching TV and seeing them on TV. So the probiotics make up your good flora. Candida makes up part of the normal flora, but it's not considered good. Candida is there more as a little instigator, a, ch a challenge to your immune system to keep it on its toes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's there in very small amounts, but it is normal to have a small amount. The problem with candida comes when something happens to imbalance your normal intestinal flora. Now, there's a whole entire list. Sugar, it could be too much. You know, what what do you find is really making things unbalanced in, in your research? Mm -hmm. It go it, the most common, of course, is always we always think in terms of antibiotic use mm -hmm. because antibiotics kill the probiotics that are living in your intestines. But it can, there's a long list of possible things that it can be. It could be you got into an accident and the shock of the accident disturbed your flora. You got into an accident, you had to go to the hospital, you're automatically put on antibiotics. Mm -hmm. You had a surgery, they put you on antibiotics. You take too many antacid pills, which will kill. The flora. You were on some type of hormone or steroid, which also kills the flora. You took chemotherapy, which also can kill your flora. And nowadays we have a new one on the list, which is COVID. We have found that COVID can cause candida and um, even more so the vaccine can cause candida. Mm -hmm. So we have this entire list of things that can cause candida, but it all boils down to the same mechanism. Something happened to destroy your friendly bacteria, and that allowed the candida to go into overgrowth. Mm -hmm. And once the candida goes into overgrowth, unfortunately, candida releases a whole host of toxins into your body that are part of its normal metabolism. These toxins would be considered metabolites or substrates of the organism, and they vary from, from alcohols to mycotoxins, which are fungal-related toxins, to neurological toxins, and the list just goes on and on. These toxins interfere with your normal metabolic processes. They affect your nervous system, your detoxification system, your, your cellular metabolism. And as this goes on, this can eventually lead to a host of symptoms that are disrelated. Like you, I wrote an article once about candida symptoms, and I said that you can you can count between 75 to 150 symptoms, depending on how you want to classify them. Mm -hmm. If you want to say bloating and gas, you can say that. Or if you just want to say bloating and say gas separately, then you can do that. But it's a minimum of 75 symptoms, and most of them are just related. The average person who develops candida begins with fatigue. And they're not quite sure what the fatigue is from or why it's happening. Then they start having digestive problems. Then they can start having cognitive problems. Their memory is not is not right. And as this as this develops, they start becoming allergic where they hadn't been before. They start becoming very chemically sensitive. It can get to the point where they become what we used to call a universal reactor, which is a person who just is reacting to everything in their environment. It can cause arthritic arthritic symptoms. Yeah, I mean it's it's wild how much of this is really connected to our gut, right? And so so what do you do? I, you know, obviously people think that by taking prebiotics, probiotics, that's enough, or by controlling your diet, or, you know, what are some things that people can actually think about and do and, and take action on to help themselves be in optimal gut health? The problem is candida is very tricky. So if the person goes to their doctor and if they get the doctor to identify this mm -hmm. and the doctor puts them on a medication, 
the, it's it's very likely that the person within three or four months is going to be relapsing again because when candida is exposed to the same medicine or drug or herb to try to kill it mm-hmm. for longer than 21 days, it starts to mutate and it starts to become drug resistant. Mm-hmm. This is why nystatin, which is one of the most popular drugs used against candida, is so um, is such a problem because many strains of candida have been exposed to nystatin and they become drug resistant to it. And this is true of herbs and medicines. So the typical story we hear from the person is I went on this program where the doctor put me on this medicine. I was feeling better for the first month or two. And then I stopped feeling better. I started feeling worse. And then he raised the dose of the medicine and that even made me feel worse. And at that point, I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. This is a typical story we hear. So now what? Well, what now you- they usually go into self-treating themselves using things they find on the internet. Mm-hmm. which usually I have the same exact reaction. There's the same limited reaction that they have. Mm-hmm. The, f- the first problem in treatment is that people haven't learned that enough that candida is very uh, sensitive, very it genetically switches very easily, and it mutates. So the first rule in treating candida, which you learn in my book, is that you must rotate the antifungals that you use. Mm-hmm. For general, For general systemic use, we usually pick four different antifungals that specifically work systemically. And we have the person rotate them four days each. So we'll typically take four four orbs or four naturopathic medicines, have the person take them for four days each. And we do that until we get the indications on the testing that we do, that they're ready to go to the next step. And the testing is done through stool, right? The testing testing that we do specifically for our program is done through urine. And what we measure, what we measure in the urine are, are metabolites of the candida, free radicals that the candida produces, and then and different proteins that are byproducts of the candida. Sometimes these things are called organic acids. And then what are some of your favorite uh, medicines or herbs that you like to rotate over this multi-day period? Well, there really aren't any. We go by what the test says, that the, the test actually indicate to us what the best medicines to use are. Okay, that's super. And so, so I personally don't have a favorite. Okay, well, that's good. I, and how does someone find out about the test, and what, how much does it typically cost? And well, usually they would um, come to our website, and they fill out the contact forms there. Mm-hmm. That's normally how they would contact us. Okay. And then what we do is we have them do an initial appointment with me where we go through a very detailed look at their history and their symptoms and all their medical conditions. And from that, I can figure out what the best testing is, because aside from the urine test that we do, there are also some other tests that you can do that are valid for candida. The trickiest one is a stool test. And why I say that's tricky is because very often candida or parasites don't make it to the lab in in one piece where the lab can replicate them. The whole idea of sending a sample of stool into the lab is so the lab can culture it or the lab can run different tests to isolate what microbes you have. And unfortunately, in many cases, when the sample gets to the lab, your own digestive juices that are part of the stool have already destroyed the organism. So the lab has not really that much to work with in terms of getting a live culture. That's why when it comes to stool testing, the most important thing that we look at is the flora, the beneficial flora, the commensal bacteria there. We want to look at the the sum aggregate of all the organisms there, and then we break them down into beneficial flora, commensal, and possible pathogens. And we look to see what the balance is. And if you essentially the the simple interpretation of a stool test is if you have an absence of gram positive friendly bacteria, which is the bifidus family and the lactobacillus family, or if you have an absence of the gram negative bacteria, which is the E. coli family, that's like a friendly E. coli, you you automatically will have candida because those are the things that are stopping the candida from overgrowing. Interesting. You and can't then- expect to find the candida on the test. It, Eight out of 10 times, that doesn't show. So when people come in and they do the testing with you, do you also help counsel in other areas besides candida? Oh, we can, but the candida, if they have candida, that's the initial thing that has to be addressed because 
the interesting thing I learned about candida all these years is as long as you have it, nothing else works. Mm -hmm. If you try to fix whatever it is, you're trying to fix what some kind of herbal program, or vitamin program, or even medicines, the effectiveness is greatly diminished by candida being there for many, many reasons. And how long do you typically find that it takes to get candida under control? Usually eight to 10 months. That's a long time. Eight to 10 months, but that's actually doing it by a test, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go online and you go to different um, online communities and boards and discussion groups, you're going to hear stories about people saying, well, this medicine handled my candida in, in a few weeks or, or whatever. And the thing that's absent in these cases is an actual test to show how much they had in the beginning and then to show the effect of whatever it is they took. They go by their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And because their symptoms key out after a few weeks on whatever it is, they're assuming that the candida is gone or, or, or greatly improved, which is not the case because their candida exists in your system in various layers. Mm -hmm. And in order to really get rid of it, you got to go through ripping out each layer and killing each layer of it. So we, when I say 10 months, eight, 10 months, that's verifying it with a test mm -hmm. that's showing that it is now really gone. It's not based on opinion or, or, or such hearsay. Well, and I would imagine that it also, you know, once you've, find the candida and treat it that while, while you're treating the candida, you're probably going to find the presence of other bacteria and viruses and things that may or may not, you know, with a compromised immune system might be uh, taken hold too. I've uh, this is a very good point. And this leads us to the word dysbiosis. Uh -huh. what, what people who have candida actually have is, a, is dysbiosis. And dysbiosis means there's an imbalance between the sum total or aggregate of all the friendly bacteria and the bad ones. Mm -hmm. So the good and the bad are out of balance. And there's there, categorically, you find candida, which represents the fungal yeast group. Then you find different types of bacteria, mm -hmm. things like Citrobacter, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, um, Staph and Strep and, and whatnot. These are all bacterial organisms. And then you find parasitic organisms. You find intestinal worms and protozoa, which, is, which are smaller. You can't see protozoa with the naked eye, the worms you can see. But the, the, the point is, is that when you have an imbalance in your intestines and it's imbalanced to the point where it will support and be favorable to the candida, it's favorable to all these other bad guys, too. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what occurs. So you, it, it's very rare that you find somebody who only has a candida overgrowth. They normally have an overgrowth of candida and these other co-infections. Yeah. And, you know, by the time folks get to you, how long? Have they typically been having symptoms and been living with this, you think? The story the story I constantly hear is that I've been battling this for the last 10 to 15 years. I've yeah. seen 20 doctors. I've spent at least $10,000. And, you know, I'm no better than I was. I'm smarter than I was, but I'm really not any better stably. Because once I go off the diet, everything just comes crashing down around me again. Yeah. As long as they're on the diet, they can hold it, hold it at bay. But once they go off the diet, and sometimes sometimes they don't even know what they did with the diet, unfortunately, because it's so it can be so tricky. Mm -hmm. Well, so which kind of goes back to your to your nutrition. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you talk to people about. I mean, obviously you have to rotate, you know, what's going to kill this because it can't just be one thing because it gets smarter and you know come back. Um, mm -hmm. But in addition to treating, you know, with the ideal ingredients, um, plant medicine, whatever that is said in the test, what kind of diet do you like to start people on? Or is it over a period of time? Or what do you suggest? The candida diet, typically, if you go online, mm -hmm. characteristically is a low sugar, low starch diet. It's similar to Atkins or a paleo diet. Or keto, I would imagine. Keto diet, similar. Yeah. It, because the primary thing that candida eats is sugars and starches. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that all candida diets have in common is that they're low in sugar and low in starch. But individually, it can be different for one person to the next based on their allergies. Mm -hmm. Because people develop people with candida develop allergies, and one person might be able to tolerate a food and another one may not. So you need to get some kind of idea of what they're allergic to or not, and then come up with a diet that's based on that and also based on their blood type because their blood type has a strong influence on this. Mm -hmm. and, and then finally, 
Leaky gut syndrome has a huge influence on the diet the person may have. Leaky gut is where the candida actually grows roots, which permeate the little blood vessels and the intestinal tract and cause um, like a an area where it's very porous, the intestines. And it allows things that normally go through your intestinal tract that would never come into your bloodstream to, to sort of filter in. Mm -hmm. And that sets off the autoimmune uh, reactions when you get candida. It's primarily, it's 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 leaky gut, but there are, candida itself can invade different glands and organs and set off an autoimmune response. It does that with the thyroid very often. But that aside, um, leaky gut limits then sometimes what people can eat because there are certain foods that really trigger and aggravate leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So a candida diet has to take that into consideration too. Well, and you know, this is a little bit off topic, but I it's, it's interesting to me how many people say that you have to put biopurine or black pepper along with certain supplements so that they absorb better. But if you have a strong autoimmune response or a leaky gut, that black pepper really kind of aggravates things and is not necessarily the best idea in the world. And you should be using some fatty acids instead. But that's, uh, it actually used to be a, a test we used to do. We used many years ago before testing was available the way it is now. Before we had zonulin tests and all these other things, we we improvised. And one of the things that we used to use to see if the person had leaky gut was black pepper. Mm. We used to have them take a take a significant amount every day with their meals and see how they felt. And if they felt worse, we pretty much concluded they must have leaky gut. That's funny. And now um, in your experience with nutrition, what do you find has kind of evolved over the years as you're, you know, certainly helping others become educated in nutrition? I, I you know, I'm, I'm in my late forties. And so I certainly can speak to what it was like in the eighties, nineties, two thousands, and all the different trends and fads we've seen. What do you, what do you find is interesting or maybe potentially a fad or anything that, you know, kind of comes to mind as you're helping the, the education system here? Well, what's helpful are the new, new lab tests and more advanced uh, advancement in lab work. That's helpful. Genetic testing is going to be the forefront to the future mm -hmm. because it has such a, it plays such a, a significant role in what's happening with the person. The patient that you're dealing with is essentially his genetics, his diet, his environment that he lives in, and his, and his himself as a as a spiritual person, and what affects him spiritually. Put all those things in a brown paper bag, shake them up, and that's what you've got. That's what he is. So understanding his genetics is very important because it gives you an idea of what could happen. The big problem with genetic testing is is really one simple very simple thing people don't understand it correctly a lot of patients when they do genetic testing they then assume that this is what i have now mm -hmm. and they start treating their genetic weaknesses which is not always to the point so a genetic test only tells you what can happen not yeah. what's happening yeah it's like Ebenezer Scrooge in that in the, in the movie, saying, "Are these shadows or things that must be, or can they be changed?" Well, for the most part, you can change or prevent, but you just don't want to assume that what your genetic test says is potentially wrong with you is actually wrong now. That's mm -hmm. what testing is for to determine what's wrong now. Yeah, no, that's a great point, and I always like to think of it in terms of you know potentially if I allow my body to get too far out of whack and allow some sort of trigger, whether it's environmental or nutrition or bacteria, viral, fungal, um, that that's potentially what could set off a whole chain of events if I don't keep things under, under watch. So that's a, that's a very good way to look at it. Yes, that's true. And then are you still involved in, in doing the testing for folks that are becoming nutritionists? Yes. Yes. So what sort Act of things are changing on the exam here kind of going forward or in the most recent? Well, there's, um, Sort of the way that this isn't really reality, but the way the trends go, they're, the testing for intestinal organisms has advanced with the use of DNA stool tests. Okay. So that's a, that's opened up sort of a new a new frontier in being able to use those tests. The zonulin test has been very good in terms of being able to determine accurately or not if a person has leaky gut. There's also a breath test which can determine nowadays if you have leaky gut based on the gases that are that are in your breath. That's a test I use very frequently. 
So is it kind of like something that is a device that you just literally breathe into and then it can tell you? Or no, you it- believe it or not, you take breath samples and mail them to the lab and the lab figures it out. Isn't that funny? It's based on the same concept as the breath tests for SIBO and for, um, um, let's say, any other organism that we're using the breath tests for, yeah. H. pylori. Well, I love this. I mean, I'm I'm a numbers and a data geek. And so, you know, anytime that I can get to the root of what's going on through data and then start solving and then retesting, it's uh, that's music to my ears. So that's fantastic. Mast cell activation is interesting mm-hmm. because um, the mast cell is something which is not new. People think it's new. They act like it's new. We In the last year, we've had all these candidate patients come to us and say, and I have mast cell activation. Well, you had mast cell activation when you first got sick. Everyone does. The only thing different about mast cell activation is we have some tests now which identify the mechanisms and the circuitry in it, but it itself is nothing new. Like any anybody who goes into that um, that severe allergic syndrome that you get with candida is suffering with mast cell. Even when you get when you get COVID and you're in the height of the infection, you're having mast cell. Mm-hmm. So, so mast cell is the thing, nothing new in that way. But it, what's interesting is what the tests we have now. We can look at the exact circuitry of it is the best way I like to describe it, and we can see how you can shut it off in one person, which might be a little different than another. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's the, that's interesting. Could or would that? I'm going to ask something I don't know the answer to. Um, could that or would would that be you know aligned with uh, levels of inflammation or um, directly? Yeah, oxidative stress and inflammation directly would relate to that. And some of the things that we find very common in people, common imbalances they have that are causing it, believe it or not, is deficiencies of molybdenum. Molybdenum is a trace mineral most people don't know much about, but molybdenum turns out to be an an element which is very important for your liver's ability to detoxify and detoxify many things, not just um, internal toxins, but also environmental toxins. So molybdenum also helps you detoxify various kinds of uh, alcohols. So we, that's something we've molybdenum and work synergistically with vitamin C, and you see it very often imbalanced in somebody who's got that mast cell. But that's true of other nutrients too, even copper. You can copper relates to histamine. Low levels of copper, you will find people with very high histamine. If the person has a high zinc to copper ratio, their histamine is very high, which is which is tip of, which is interesting. Also, the same thing is true of cholesterol. People with high levels of zinc relative to copper have higher total cholesterol than people who have those elements more balanced. And cholesterol is also involved in the cycle of detoxifying histamines, which most people don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's a relationship between that ratio and all those um, allied conditions. Isn't that wild? Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Anything else that you want to make sure folks think about, learn about, how do they find you? Anything that really comes to mind that you want to be able to share? Well, if the if the person thinks they may have candida, they really want to get a copy of my book, The Candida Chronicles, so that they don't make all the mistakes that people who haven't read the book will make mm-hmm. or that I made when I was first treating people with candida. Mm-hmm. That's really important is that if they feel they have candida, they get the book. The second thing is, how do you arrive at thinking you might have candida? Well, you may want to look at symptoms, which is how typically what we hear a lot of people will say, you know, I I looked at all these symptoms in this article and I said, wow, that's me. How do you arrive at that person is best to sit down and draw like a timeline and see if they can map out when different symptoms occurred. Mm-hmm. because they, they occur over time. They don't happen. It would be great if it happened all at once. You could say, aha, but that's not what happens. So mm-hmm. if they draw a timeline and put where their symptoms occurred and then go back to the beginning before they had any symptoms, then come forward, try to find out, try to look for an event that took place mm-hmm. that might be the area where all this started and it was triggered. And very typically that event you're looking for is when they were on antibiotics for a length of time, if they had an accident, they were, had a surgery, or there was something it's something significant that they had to go on medication for. Or they had food poisoning is another thing that gets overlooked. Sometimes people will travel 
They'll develop really bad food poisoning and the food poisoning wipes out their flora. And thereafter, they start developing candida. So it's very helpful if they do something like this because it could help them to determine, yes, I pro- the probability of me having candida is high, but also when you go to the practitioner, it's really helpful for him because most practitioners at least know that you develop candida by having a flora imbalance. So if you can document for them where this might have occurred and then what, what occurred afterwards with the symptoms, that's a great help to them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. And what's your website? How would people book an appointment with you and find your book and everything else? What's the. Okay. The book is on Amazon, like everything else. And my main website is health-truth.com. That's the main site. And we have two other sites. We have the New York city candida doctor and the New York city thyroid doctor. Mm -hmm. Now why thyroid people may ask, well, there's a tremendous relationship between candida and thyroid. It's not typically understood or recognized, but it's there. And it's there enough where we actually specialize in handling uh, thyroid cases from the viewpoint of how candida is interfering with the thyroid gland. So in in that instance, do you take a look first at candida and then you test the thyroid? And do you test that through blood, through how are you doing that? Normally, people come to us and they already know this. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, the patients are getting much more sophisticated by studying things on the net. So very commonly, the patient will come to us and they say, I have candida and I know there's something going on with my thyroid because I've been taking my body temperatures and I see my temperatures are off. That's one of the first things people will come across is the work of Broda Barnes. Broda Barnes wrote a book many years ago called Hypothyroidism, the Unsuspected Illness. And that was followed up by doctors writing um, some other books regarding reverse T3. You might have heard Wilson syndrome. And also nowadays, there's a website by Dr. Rind, R-I-N-D. And Dr. Rind has some, he's basically perfected the use of taking your temperatures to understand your endocrine function. So Dr. Rind will have the person take a set of temperatures. And from those temperatures, he can see and plot out how your thyroid hormone is being utilized by your cells and also how your adrenals are functioning. Blood work is limited with thyroid. Blood, all blood work tells you is what thyroid gland is releasing into your blood that's maybe a hormone or do you have antibodies attacking your thyroid? That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you anything about the actual mechanics of how well your body utilizes your thyroid hormone. Yeah. That's, some, that's something that you have to study as a separate study. And the people that are best at understanding this are nutritionists. Because nutritionists understand cellular metabolism, and as as it turns out, the like the, the you've heard of them, you've heard of the term a receptor site. Mm-hmm. Okay, the receptor sites for the hormone are all based on nutrients. Mm-hmm. This was first looked at by Guyton in the Guyton Guyton's book of physiology. Guyton's like the father of physiology, and in the book Guyton wrote that somehow not fully understood yet. He said calcium. And potassium act as receptors or governors for thyroid hormone. He he was he talked about how your cells would be sensitive to thyroid hormone based on how much calcium and potassium you had. And he actually came up with, with a ratio back then that holds true to today. So calcium acts as a governor. It depresses or downregulates thyroid hormone, and potassium in your cells upregulates thyroid hormone. And that's where you find these people who are allegedly their hormones are low in their blood or barely normal, but they're heavily, as as far as symptomatic um, issues go, low thyroid. They're functionally low thyroid. But yet the doctor looks at this and he doesn't understand it because the hormones are in the normal range. What he doesn't understand is that the hormones not being accepted properly by the cells because you, your thyroid hormones come into your cells, go through the electron transport chain, then they come to the receptor sites. And now you have the balance of calcium and copper versus zinc and potassium to regulate how sensitive your cells will be to the effect of the hormone. And that's something you can go to the the most famous thyroid doctor in, on Park Avenue, and he's not going to have a, he's going to look at you like you're nuts. He has no clue what you're talking about. Uh-huh. But yet that's but that's a very important aspect in rebalancing someone's thyroid. I can't tell you how many people I've gotten off thyroid medication by rebalancing their receptors. It's ridiculous, actually. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you. 
Well, doctor, you have been a complete joy to have on. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you're sharing around candida and around thyroid and so much more around nutrition. And of course, all the tests that we could and should do to really get to the answer of what's going on with us and then, you know, get that visualized. So thank you so much. You're more than welcome. I enjoyed being here. That's it for this episode of Encouraging Wellness. We hope this serves as an eye-opener to you on new ways to approach your health and wellness. By learning both unique and the best alternative wellness and healing methods, you can live your best life. Listen to more of our episodes at www.hello.health. Be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a rating. Together, let us work towards unlocking you and your family's best self. Thank you for listening. See you on the next one.